Today's reading comes from the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. This is out of the New International Version of Scripture. It's entitled, The Rich and the Kingdom of God. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, we have left everything to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brother or sister or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. These are the scriptures revealing the word of God to the people of God. Thank Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated. Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Those words came from a slightly breathless man who, obviously, he has it all together. He is young, vastly wealthy, and, and, and at least that's what the text tells us. And the fact that he is concerned about his salvation, it kind of gives us an insight that he's also wise. The fact that he comes running to Jesus to ask the question tells us that he is a zealous man who wants to follow the Lord. Well, to the disciples and others around, this is an excellent prospect for a follower. I mean, they wish that everyone would follow Jesus, of course, but, but this kind of guy, this kind of guy right here, he's got his act together. He's the kind of guy who would volunteer to serve on the committees and get a lot of work done. He's, a, he's the kind of guy that would be an asset to whatever sort of plan or strategy needed to be launched. And it looks like he's nearly in. Despite his cool confidence, he, he actually ran to where Jesus is and knelt before Jesus. All the disciples, they must be breathing a sigh of relief at this because for them it's been a rough few weeks. I mean, first there was a fiasco after the miracle of feeding the 5,000 where many of the disciples, they... they just disappeared, they left. Then there's been these strange, discomforting predictions by Jesus himself that he's going to be crucified. But here, here is a really nice change. A rich, young, intelligent guy has appeared who wants to be a disciple. But the conversation doesn't actually go the way it's supposed to. 
at least not the way the disciples thought it was supposed to go. I mean, who would ever imagine that the slam-dunk disciple would walk away sorrowful just a few moments later? What happens? Well, let's examine the exchange and glean what we can out of this passage. Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Asked this rich young man. There's the problem already. Okay? The problem has already begun because the question he asked was flawed. Listen again. You'll catch it. Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? The question tells us the man assumes that he can work his way into heaven by the things he does. What he's asking Jesus is this. All right, Jesus, how much more of God's law do I have to keep in order to earn my way into eternal life? What do I have to do? Now, although this man is sincere, and he is, he's very sincere, but he's also very far from faith. He doesn't want Jesus to save him from sin, but to approve of who he is and the good that he has done. Since the man asks a question about keeping the commandments, well, Jesus gives him an answer about keeping the commandments, doesn't he? Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your mother and your father. In other words, since the man asks, what shall I do to, that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus says, you shall keep God's commandments. And the Lord proceeds to give him a sampling of the ten. But this preaching of the law only leaves the man smug, doesn't it? Ah, oh, is that all there is to it? He's nearly home free already, isn't he? What good news, I, as he exalts, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Yep, this guy's a slam dunk disciple, isn't he? But then the bomb drops. Jesus, who loves the man, Jesus, who loves the man, preaches one more bit of law. One thing you lack, says the Lord, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. This time, the man sees how the law accuses him, and it crushes him. Jesus has just pointed out to him his sin. But what sin is that exactly? Well, the sin our Lord condemns here is not wealth. Jesus is not preaching a sermon against the evils of being rich. We must make that clear so that we can understand the true sin and the marvelous gospel of this text. Bible stories like this have been used to declare that wealth is innately sinful. Therefore, for instance, back in the 16th century, it was considered a great work to sell everything you had and make a vow of poverty. For it was believed that poverty was considered to be more pleasing to God than anything else. But that's not what the Lord is saying in this text. Now granted, wealth does have its dangers. It does. As the Lord will go on to say, those who have riches are tempted to trust in those riches instead of the Lord. So is sin, is the sin here greed? Well, there is some greed here, yes. The man has much in the way of riches and he would rather keep them than to love his neighbor and give them to the poor. So, so yeah, there's some greed at play here. But the greed is not the big problem. There's a far more dangerous sin at work. The greater sin is this. The man thinks he can save himself by how well he works at keeping God's commands. He believes that he can work his way into heaven by being good enough. 
when Jesus lists several commandments, the man, he's delighted because he can check them off and say, yep, kept that one. Oh, I'm on track on that one. Yep, done that one. But then the Lord says to him, if you were so virtuous that you can keep all of God's commandments, then you won't be in love with your money and you'll be able to just give it all away. If you're going to save yourself by your work, then prove it. Thus the Lord shows the man that he suffers from greed. Though he didn't know it at the time. And because he suffers from the sin of greed, he isn't keeping all of God's commands. And he can't earn eternal life on his own terms. Now, for greed, the man can be forgiven of that. He can be forgiven as he trusts in Jesus, the Savior. But as long as the man believes that he can save himself, he doesn't trust Jesus to save him. Without that trust, there's, there's no forgiveness. The Lord basically shoots out his entire plan of salvation. But listen carefully to the, work, to the Lord's words again. <clears throat> no one is good but one. That is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. One thing you lack. Go your way. Sell whatever you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come. Take up the cross and follow me. Jesus, he preaches the law. Yes, he does. He preaches the law in order to show the man that he cannot save himself. So he tells the man to sell all that he has. But the Lord does so in order that the man might be saved. Therefore, Jesus preaches the gospel saying, Come, take up your cross and follow me. In other words, Jesus says to the man, You can't save yourself. I love you, but you cannot save yourself. But I can I will save you by going to the cross and dying for your sin. Do not trust in your own efforts, but in mine. I will share my cross with you so that you don't have to suffer and die for your sin. You can't save yourself, but I can do it for you. Thus the Lord declares to this man the gospel, telling him that he will bear the cross for him. But it's too much for the man and his preconceived notion. He, he arrived expecting the Lord's blessing of keeping the laws and perhaps for his well-run life and his wealth. Quite frankly, he was looking for a holy attaboy. Instead, he was told to throw it all away and to trust in the cross instead. This is not the way he wanted salvation. And this is not the way he wants the Savior to be. Therefore, he walks away. The would-be disciple, the one who was supposed to be a slam dunk, the guy who had everything going his way, walks away. Jesus, he just lets him go. He just lets him go. One can even imagine the frowns of disapproval by, by some gathered around that Jesus would drive such a prospect away with his teaching, but Jesus just lets him go. He loves the man, but in love he will not force the man to be repentant. He will, however, go to the cross and die for the man's sins. And if later on the man repents of his sins, the benefits of the cross will be there for him. The man walks away, and the disciples now demonstrate their distinctive ability to completely miss the point. Jesus begins to explain how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And it's not because riches are inherently sinful, no, 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 but because those who have wealth see little need for a Savior. I mean, brothers and sisters, wealth is an easy thing to trust in. 
And those who trust in wealth aren't trusting in Christ. And so Jesus says, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And disciples, they are astonished at this. That would-be slam-dunk disciple had everything going from him for him. And if he can't get into heaven, well then who can? Jesus expands. Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And once again, the disciples are completely astonished. If those who have so much going for them can't, can't get into heaven, then who can be saved? And so to the disciples, the Lord preaches a one-sentence sermon of law and gospel once again. With men, it's impossible. But not with God. But with God, all things are possible. The law. You can't. You can't save yourself. The law proves that. The gospel. God can. God can. He can save you because His Son is going to the cross. The message remains the same. He can't save you. He has to save you. And He has saved you. Unfortunately, because we simple human beings keep asking the wrong questions, we keep coming up with the wrong answers. I mean, sometimes the question is crystal clear as that of the rich man in the text. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? I mean, right away we're saying there, there's got to be something that, that we can do. But sadly, even though the question is wrong, there are plenty who are happy to give you an answer. And it will be a wrong answer. What do I mean? In more than one church, the answer is that you must do good works in order to inherit eternal life. Keep all the commandments, at least as well as you can, and the Lord will graciously open the gates of heaven unto thee. Or there's another popular doctrine going, up, going amongst individuals. As long as I belong to and or attend the church at least a uh, few numbers of times during the year, I've done enough and eternal life is mine. As long as I do my best each and every day, I mean, what more can God ask of me, right? This is hardly confined to the church. That's a theology of the world, isn't it? Do your best. Do right by other people, and heaven is yours. The answer is appealing to our sinful nature. It means we can do this on our own. But if thought through, it's not a good answer at all. How much is enough? How many good works must you do in order to inherit eternal life? Can you do enough good works? The answer? No, you can't. You can't do enough. Or as sometimes this, the question will be more subtle. Now that Jesus saved me, and I hear this one way too much. Now that Jesus has saved me, what's, what must I do to keep that salvation? Well, it starts out well. It credits Jesus with our salvation. But it goes on to assume that we build our faith and keep our salvation by the works that we do. Hence, many will think and teach, now that you've been saved, you can be sure, you can be sure that, now that you've been saved, make sure you have maintained your salvation by helping others. Or now that you're a Christian, you can be sure you are saved as long as you're improving. Or now that you're a Christian, you can be sure you're saved as long as you feel better than you felt before. Let me be clear on this. I don't want anybody tripping up on this. Let me be clear. Is it wrong to help others? Is it wrong to improve on some behaviors or habits? Is it wrong to feel better? No, it is not wrong. 
okay? It is not long at all. But nor do any of these things cause God to love us or to save us. If we believe that God loves us now because of these things, then we are saying that God loves us for these things instead of Christ. Is this right? No. Can you build your faith and maintain your salvation by your works? No, you can't. But, but pastor, doesn't the book of James teach that faith without good works is dead? Yes, it does. And rightly so. But listen to me, people. Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere does James ever suggest that good works is a substitute for the cross of Christ. That good works alone will save you. He never suggested that. But it does suggest, instead, that good works should be evident in the life of a Christian because of the salvation you have received through Christ and His gift of the Holy Spirit. But that's a topic for a whole different sermon, okay? So whenever we ask, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? The answer from the Lord is this, you can't. With humanity, it's impossible, but not with God, for with God, all things are possible. There's an answer, and there is salvation, but it's an answer to a different question. The question is not, what shall I do that I may in, uh, inherit eternal life? The question is, what has the Lord done to give me eternal life? That is the correct question. And to such a question, there is good news in abundance. What has the Lord done? Look to the good teacher in the text for this day. You may be familiar with the slight comment, those who do, those who can do, and those who can't teach. You've heard that said before, right? Well, <coughs> such is not the case here. Because the good teacher taught, and he did. All those commandments that he listed for the rich young man, Jesus kept, and he kept them perfectly. He kept all of God's laws with not one sin, not a single one. Did he give all that he had to the poor? Yes, he did. He gave all he had, not just for the poor, but for all people. He offered his back to those who scourged him. He offered his scalp to those who would crown him with thorns. He allowed his hands, his feet, and his side to be pierced for this sinful world. Did he give all? Oh, yes. He gave all. He gave all in a depth that we cannot even begin to contemplate. Unlike the rich young man, he did take up his cross. Yes, he did. He took up the cross, and on that cross, he died for the sins of the world. That is what the Lord has done. You can't. He has. But he's also not finished. That good teacher now offers that cross to you. By his holy law preached to you this day, he still warns and accuses of sin. Not so that you're going to walk away sorrowful, but that you might repent and turn away from that which would destroy you. And by His Holy Gospel, He gives you His cross. He takes away your sins that, so, so you need not suffer and die for them because He already has. He gives you His righteousness. His righteousness giving you the credit and the benefit of his perfect keeping of God's law. He makes you his family, actual members of his household. He gives you his body and his blood in Holy Communion that you might join into his life. You can't. He can. 
He does. And He does it faithfully again and again and again, granting you forgiveness for your sins. Brothers and sisters, this is the good news He has for us. That He has one salvation for us and that He gives it to us freely. And people, this is the message that He calls us to proclaim as a church continually and faithfully. At times, people look here and they'll walk away. Even some as attractive as and with it as this Yitch, rich young ruler. We watch such go with sorrow, praying that they will return to the grace of God. And we continue to preach this same life-giving gospel which our Lord proclaimed and fulfilled. You are sure of your salvation, not because you can earn it, but because He has won it for you. He has won it by His death and His resurrection. Amen. And amen.